As professor of history at the University of Toronto and the former warden of St. Anthony's College, Oxford, prolific scholar of the British Empire, the First World War, and its aftermath, you have brought the lessons of history to audiences well beyond the academy. Your best-selling books, including Women of the Raj, Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, Nixon and Mao, and the Uses and Abuses of History, shortening some of those titles, um, they have been read by virtually everyone in this room and thousands and thousands of people across the globe. Your most recent books, The War That Ended Peace, The Road to, to 1914, and History's People Focus On, as do your frequent articles in the press, the fact that, and I quote you here, we can ignore history and often do, but it will not ignore us. Many have recognized the specific and powerful way you bring history to contemporary audiences. In addition to the prestigious Samuel Johnson Prize, you've received the Duff Cooper Prize for Outstanding Literary Work in the Field of History, and the Penn Hessel Tiltman Prize for History, among many, many, many other citations. Now, if that sounds like a laudation, it should, because on Monday, Margaret McMillan will be our commencement speaker and will be receiving an honorary degree and she will be addressing the graduating body of AUP 2019 and for the historians in the room, she will be telling our students why they must read history and reminding them, charging them with the responsibilities they're unto appertaining. That's what happens at commencement. So to shift tone a little bit now, most recently in an article in the Wall Street Journal, you saw in the relative and perhaps naive piece of 1989, when we thought we'd reached the end of the Cold War, the inevitable rise of, and I quote you here, the turbulent and disturbing world of 2019. Citing again the complex lessons of history as a means of understanding our present, you worried at the end of that article that, quote, there is not sufficient will around the globe to uphold an international order. So we are eager to hear today now that we're, I think, 31 days out from the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, your perspective on Versailles at 100 at this other disquieting moment of apparent world disorder. And we're also curious to leave you with a second question about your response to this sort of nascent, emerging, revisionist history of the Versailles moment, the 1919 moment, and of the plethora of characters that our panelists have brought forward to center stage over the past few days. Thank you so much for being with us today. What an honor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Celeste, and I think the honor is mine. It's been a great, great privilege to be here and to be in Paris to learn something of the American University here, to meet some of your students, to meet some of your faculty, and meet, to meet many of your devoted alumni. You seem to have a very strong um, set of supporters out there, which is wonderful. And the conference itself, I think, has, has been fascinating because it's, in, it's included uh, people who are interested in history, it's included practitioners who have themselves made history, and it's included scholars both very established and, and distinguished scholars like Professor Sutu and, and Professor Tuz, and also scholars who are now making their mark, and I think most encouragingly, the young scholars who are beginning to make their marks. It's been a great privilege to hear all the different panels and very encouraging to think that there are all these people coming along who are going to be contributing so much to history. Well, my task is to wind up and, and not stand too long between you and the next round of, of drinks and whatever <laughs> entertainment is laid on for us. But I want to try and assess the Peace Conference and, and, and talk about it a century later. And as others have said and have made clear in these two days, we have been, I think, collectively looking at the Peace Conference again. We have been broadening our understanding of it. When I started working on it, virtually everything written on the Peace Conference was on Europe and the Americas. There was almost nothing, and then that was North America. There was very little on the impact of the Peace Conference on Africa, Australasia, on the empires, on, on Latin America. And I think that is something that has changed much for the better. I think we now have a much broader understanding of something that had been a global event and a global catastrophe and a global response to it. The peace conference was not ever just about the Treaty of Versailles, but that is still, I think, how, that was how people used to look at it, perhaps still a bit 
uh, look at it in that way, but I think there has been a real interest now in looking at the more general issues of the peace conference. What I think is sometimes dispiriting is that the old view of the peace conference is one that is very deeply rooted and, and very, very difficult to get rid of. John Maynard Keynes wrote his very short book with a very dull title, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, in six weeks in the summer of 1919, and it's been a bestseller ever since. It has never been out of print, it has been translated into many languages, and it still shapes much of the popular perception of what the peace settlements were about. And I remember when I was finishing my book, uh, just around uh, the, the turn of the, of the last um, century, it was, it, it was New Year's Day, I think, 2000, and for some reason I decided to divert myself by reading The Economist, which is not what you really want to read when you're planning to have a holiday. And The Economist had this offhand phrase about, you know, it is now, you know, looking back at that dreadful catastrophe of, of 1919, which set the stage for the Second World War. And I thought, you know, they're still saying it. And I hope that possibly my book will make some difference. I don't think it really has. I think the popular perception is still out there that the, the peace conference was a disaster. Let me just read to you from Keynes, because this is the view that I think has persisted. Paris was a nightmare, and everyone there was morbid. A sense of impending catastrophe overhung the frivolous scene. The futility and smallness of man before the great events confronting him. The mingled insignificance and unreality, significance and unreality of the decisions. Levity, blindness, insolence, confused cries from without, all the elements of an ancient tragedy were there. The statesmen, he said, were hypocritical, subtle and dangerous spellbinders engaged in empty and arid intrigue. The Treaty of Versailles, he said, was imbecile greed, oppression and rapine, dishonorable, ridiculous and injurious. And his sketches of the statesmen in Paris, which again have persisted down to the Paris, were of a collection of boobies, his word for President Wilson, um, half human, half goat, his description of Lloyd George, and a vindictive ape, his description of Clemenceau. And they sat there, Clemenceau thinking only of revenge, Lloyd George gambling out of the Welsh mists like some ancient pagan creature with no moral core whatsoever, and Woodrow Wilson, like someone with a, with a blindfold on in a child's game, being spun round and round and round, and round by, by the wily and devious Europeans until he didn't know whether he was coming or going. This is not a fair view, but it is one that is, is I say, very deeply rooted. And allied to that view is that what happened in 1919 led directly to 1939, that decisions made in 1919 caused the Second World War, and that's simply the shorthand version of what happened. I think my short answer to that is, A, that those in Paris were not, as Keynes described them, they were not perfect human beings, but they were people trying, with the advice of often very talented and, and knowledgeable people, to make the best of a very complicated situation. But also, B, that if you are arguing that 1919 led directly to 1939, my question always is, what was everyone doing for 20 years? You know, things were happening in those 20 years, decisions were being made or not made that helped to lead to the Second World War. And I think it's quite possible to imagine that war being averted. I think we need to look at what happened in those intervening 20 years and not blame everything on what happened in 1919. Having said that, I think some of the decisions and some of the aftermath, perhaps more importantly, of the, second, of the First World War did create the conditions which made the Second World War possible. But I don't like to think, and I think we shouldn't think, because I think it's actually quite dangerous, that history is inevitable, that you are foredoomed to go down a particular path, then you have no choice. I think if we start thinking that, it's actually very dangerous. And I think what we must do as we look back at those decisions that were made or not made in 1919 and the years immediately afterwards, I think we have to understand the circumstances in which people were making them. They did not have a totally free hand. 
To understand them is not to excuse them, but it is at least to understand what it is that they were grappling with. What were they facing? What sort of issues did they have? How much power did they actually have to influence what was going on? They were powerful, but their power was not unlimited. And they were dealing, I think, with very diff difficult circumstances at the end of a great and turbulent war whose effects were still rippling through European society and rippling through the world. And I think we need to ask, in a spirit of humility, what would we have done? I think we too often tend to look back at the past as if we are judges, judges who know all, omniscient judges, omnipotent judges, who look back and say, you should have done this, you should have done that. Let us remember that people don't have a free hand. We don't have a free hand in our own times. And I think we need to remember that. And I'm not, again, as I say, this is not to excuse them, but I think what we need to do is try and understand them. I would argue that we need also to understand that what was happening in the world in 1919 was, yes, in part a result of the First World War, but some of it were causes much deeper, things that had been changing long before 1914. In some cases, those, those changes were going to be speeded up by the war of 1914, 1918, but some of them were changes that were going to happen anyway, which were going to go on affecting society. And that was part of the context with which the peacemakers were dealing. And so, for example, just to give you some of the, the very complicated changes that were happening and were going to continue to happen after 1919, the world of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century was experiencing increasingly rapid change. This was a time of terrific change scientific change, technological change, the capacity of society to produce goods, the nature of society. I mean, people at the time realized it. In fact, there was concern about the pace of change. People felt that it was all happening too quickly. It was rather like what I think a lot of us have been feeling about with globalization and the changes coming with, for example, the, the vast changes in the electronic revolution through which we're living, or the changes which we're facing now and what it means to be human. Um, because we're facing changes which may make it possible to do things genetically to human beings or to implant them with types of artificial intelligence, which may well change the whole nature of human nature. And this is something that people were thinking about and worrying about in the period before 1914. It was an age of tremendous globalization, as great an age, I think, in its own way as the last two decades, and three decades, which we've lived through. And I think the changes in rapid communications, we tend to think that the internet is something extraordinary. But think of what the telegraph meant. Think of what that network of telegraph, as someone showed yesterday, a map of the telegraph lines that link the world. This was extraordinary. For the first time, humanity was able to get news from the other side of the world, from across the channel, from the other side of the continent, almost instantaneously. And this changed the nature of decisions. It changed the nature of the ways in which people thought about the world. And so very, very significant changes were taking place in society. And there were real pressures that came along with those changes pressures of rapid change, the pressures that came along with modernity, a sense that the old values were disappearing and it wasn't clear what the new values were going to be. And what you got before the First World War are some of the reactions that we are getting today. We're getting a reaction of people taking refuge in older identities, looking back to sometimes often imagined ethnic identities, but looking for comfort in older identities, people getting nostalgic for the Middle Ages, people looking for worlds that somehow seem simpler, uh, more, more real, somehow different from the world in which they were living. Or you've got people who wanted to continue the pace of change, but change it in very radical directions. The period before 1914 was a period of radical and revolutionary socialism, often marked by assassinations and terrorist attacks. In Paris, for example, bombs were thrown on the floor of the Paris Stock Exchange. A terrorist walked into a cafe not that far from here and shot the first person he saw because he said he just wanted to make a statement. And he decided to shoot the first middle class person he saw. And it seems to me this is not unlike some of what's happening today. But there is a sense that perhaps people are reacting to change, often in, in positive ways, but sometimes in very negative ways. Europe also was beginning to experience tremendous internal pressures, but it was also there was an unease growing that Europe's era might one day come to an end. Europe in 1914 was the central part of the world. 
it was the most powerful part of the world collectively. It was the financial center of the world. It was the industrial center of the world. It dominated much of the world's globe. I mean, if you look at maps of the period in 1914, much of the world is colored one color or another, red for the British Empire, um, I think green for the German Empire, I think blue for the French Empire. I can't remember them all. But much of the world was dominated either directly or indirectly by Europe, but that dominance was beginning to be challenged. The empires themselves were beginning, in the case of India, for example, and certainly in the case of countries like my own, Canada, to press apart. They, they were beginning to get nationalist movements developing in the empires, which were making it more and more difficult for the empires to manage their affairs. Someone, I think, said yesterday that empire ran partly on the consent of those who were being ruled, and that consent was gradually being withdrawn and was going to be withdrawn a lot quick, more quickly after the First World War. And new powers were rising. Japan in the Far East was becoming a significant regional power, not a world power, but very, very important in the Far East. And it was a mark of how important Japan was becoming that the British signed a military treaty with it, a naval treaty, in 1902. The British didn't usually sign such treaties in peacetime, and, and they found it advantageous to do so. And of course, in the West, to the West of Europe, the United States was a rising power. Its industrial output, as Adam Tooze pointed out yesterday, was going up with enormous rapidity. And you could argue that Russia, half European, half non-European, half, half, half Asian, was also one of these new rising powers. It had a very high growth rate, probably one of the highest growth rates in the 20th century, just before 1914. It was industrializing very quickly. And so the old order was beginning to change in a number of ways, socially, economically, intellectually, and also in the balance of power in the world. Well, of course, what the war did was in some cases stop some of these changes. It stopped them certainly for a time in Russia, which was going to be set back enormously economically and politically by the war. But it speeded up other sorts of changes. The social changes that were occurring were forced ahead and forced sometimes into different directions by the First World War. The empires came out of the war much weakened. They were financially weakened, economically weakened. Many of their markets had now been taken over by either the Japanese or the Americans, and that was something that was not going to change and go back. There was also a sense that Europeans had, and a lot of the rest of the world had, that they had done something forever irrevocable to themselves, forever damaging. There was a sense that European civilization and people had talked in these terms before the First World War, which they had seen as superior, which they had seen as in the forefront of all human civilizations, was no longer there, that it was not the civilization they had thought, and that they had inflicted such damage on themselves that they might never really recover. Uh, they thought, of course, at the time, that they would never have a second global war like the one they had just come through, but the mere contemplation of another such war was something that Europeans most didn't want to do. What you also got after 1919 was political turbulence, and we've heard quite a lot about this in the preceding, in, in these two days, a revolution in Russia, and that revolution was plunging Russia into turmoil. Russia was engaged in a civil war. No one knew what was going to happen in Russia, but for many people around the world, of course, what was happening in Russia seemed like a signal of hope. For others, of course, it seemed like something disastrous. But the Russian Revolution was being watched around the world by others who felt themselves to be oppressed, who wanted change. And a number of revolutions were beginning to break out spontaneously. And I think Lenin hoped that it would be like a forest fire or a prairie fire that would spread throughout the world. And the revolution in Russia would not be on its own, that it would be part of a much wider world revolution. And for a time, certainly in 1919 and through the early 1920s, it looked like what Lenin hoped for and what others such as Winston Churchill or Marshal Foch of France feared, and many people of course feared it, was going to happen. There was a communist revolution in Bavaria. It only lasted for a week and was a bit of a comic affair, although it ended in bloodshed. But there was a much more serious and longer lasting communist revolution and government in Hungary for six months between 1919 and 1920. There was an attempted communist revolution in Berlin in January 1920. There were violent insurrections in the Italian streets, in France, in Britain, sometimes violent. On May Day, the 1st of May 1919, the peace conference virtually had to close down because there were the traditional demonstrations, workers' demonstrations, but some of them turned violent and the authorities cracked down.
with equal violence. It's been estimated, nobody knows how many people died that day, but it's been estimated anywhere up to 1,000 people died in the streets of Paris on the 1st of May. And so there was, I think, in the minds of those who were here making peace, a real fear that if they didn't move quickly, the world was trembling on the edge of something even worse than what they had seen. And of course, what the war had done, as, as, as was mentioned earlier, it had destroyed or brought to the end four great empires. The Ottoman Empire still limped on, but it was doomed to disappear. Austria-Hungary had disappeared before the end of the war. Russia, which had been an empire, had of course fallen to pieces after 1917. And Germany, which was an empire with both overseas possessions, but also had conquests in Europe, Alsace-Lorraine in, in the west, and parts of the old kingdom of Poland in the east, was also in the process of falling to pieces. And so nobody really knew what was going to happen. And what the people who were meeting in Paris found themselves dealing with was the immediate problems and the long-term problems caused by this political upheaval in Europe, which of course was beginning to ripple out into the world. The immediate problems they faced was that as the empires broke up, and as many small wars broke out, and the wars, little wars, the, the wars that Winston Churchill called, he said, the wars of the giants have ended, he said in 1918, the wars of the pygmies are starting. But these wars were, were more than little, and they went on until 1923 in much of Europe and parts of the Middle East. A war, for example, between the newly emerging state of Poland and Russia was a bitter war, caused thousands of casualties. There were other such wars, small wars, but not so small between, say, Poland and Czechoslovakia, conflicts. And what that meant, apart from anything else, was that as political structures fell to pieces and as chaos spread across Europe, old economic structures also fell to pieces. The whole, the networks that had fed and supplied European cities and had made it possible for people in the countrysides to sell their goods simply collapsed. Vienna was starving, just to give you one example, in the winter of 1918-1919 because the food that had come from what was now the independent country of Hungary was not coming. There was now a border, there were not, the railways were not there, rolling stock was being seized by different countries as they emerged on the map of Europe. The coal that the Viennese needed in any case to bake their bread and to heat had come from somewhere else, had come from what was now Poland or Czechoslovakia, and so the Red Cross which was providing emergency relief in Vienna, said they were feeding people who had the sorts of diseases caused by hunger which they had never thought to see in Europe. Children were literally starving. One day a horse fell down probably of hunger itself in the streets of Vienna and those who were there said it had literally disappeared within about half an hour as people rushed to cut it up because it was their only chance of food that day. And now such scenes were being replicated all over Europe. And so what the peacemakers found themselves dealing with was the fear of longer term revolution and, and chaos and more war. They also found themselves dealing with the very real and pressing problems of just trying to keep Europe going again. And so what happened, and the Paris Peace Conference I think wasn't intended to be this, what happened, particularly in the intense part of the Congress, which lasted from the beginning of January 1919 until the 28th of June 1919, when the Treaty of Versailles, which was the most difficult one to put together, as, and, and as Professor Su Tu explained it so well, um, was very complex, and with the result that they never really, they couldn't negotiate it with the Germans. But what happened was that a peace conference that was meant to be focusing on drawing up the treaties, drawing up the instrument for the new world order that President Woodrow Wilson had envisaged and simply settling the, the normal business that you settled at the end of the war found itself acting as a sort of government because what you had in Paris was some of the most powerful people in the world representing some of the most powerful countries in the world. And so they found themselves, without I think ever really intending it, dealing with these very pressing problems, dealing with the problems of feeding Europe, dealing with the problems of trying to impose order. And so it is in a way a sort of example of what a, a world government might look like. I mean, no one intended this, but it was a type of organization which helped, I think, to encourage the emergence later on of new structures, new norms, new practices, new ways of doing things. And so what was happening in Paris in those six months, and I say these were the most important six months, even though the conference itself went on technically into 1920, because that's when all the big powers were there. On the 28th of June, Lord George went back to Britain and, and Wilson went back to 
the United States. And then the conference went on and dealt with other peace treaties and other arrangements that it wasn't as important as, as it had been. And so what we had for those six months, and we will never have anything like it in the world again. It's possible to think of the world statesmen today meeting for more than two and a half days, if that. You know, that's about the limit of which they could, which they could be away from where they are. And they usually are totally scripted before they go, and they go through their various meetings, and then they go home. But this was really something quite different. What they were trying to deal with, of course, apart from dealing with these endless problems that came in every day, was trying to make a peace that would last. And this was something, I think, that they agreed on. I mean, they, they, they disagreed on a lot. They, of course, had different national interests, as, as they should and as you expect. But they were trying to deal with issues of building a peace that would last. Now, some of what they were doing was new. I think the, the, the pressing nature of what they had to do in trying to keep Europe afloat and trying to prevent the chaos and disorder in the world from spreading was, was perhaps not something that previous peace conferences had ever dealt with at scale. But what they were also having to do was try and set up structures that would prevent another war. And this is something that, of course, peoples always try and do at the end of the war. And they were very conscious of what it is that Europe had come through and what it is that the world had come through. Paris itself showed the marks of the war. It had been shelled by the long-range Krupp guns, but most of the trees along the Champs-Élysées had been cut down for firewood, and virtually everyone on the streets, every Parisian, was wearing black or had a black armband because so many people knew had lost people. The French lost the highest proportion of men um, the highest proportion of men of military age of any other combatant, I think, with the single exception of Serbia. And so the extent of the losses was very clear. And you could take a bus or a car or a train and go up to the frontier in a day, as we saw in one of those slides, and just look at what had happened. And so I think they knew very well what the level of destructions were, what, what the level of destruction was. And so they found themselves trying to hold together, possibly as a coalition, dealing with their different national interests. They found themselves trying to deal with what was going on in the world. And they found themselves having to sit down and try and make peace. What they had to deal with, and I think, again, this is where the context is important, they had to deal with how you deal with the defeated enemy. And that is something that previous peace conferences had dealt with. That's what they'd had to deal with at Vienna. But they had certain factors which they hadn't had to think about at Vienna. The statesmen who met at the Congress of Vienna between 1814 and 1815, which wound up the French Revolutionary and the Napoleonic Wars, didn't really answer to anyone except small elites. They answered to their monarchs in the case of Metternich, or in the case of Lord Castlereagh, they answered to the king and to a very small parliament. But they didn't have to worry about public opinion on any scale. And this was something very new and something the Paris Peace Conference was really going to be very different in experiencing. Public opinion had become a real factor in politics in the course of the 19th century. And you can see it, there was a spread of democracy, more and more people had the franchise, more and more people were able to read and write, more and more people were informed about what was going on, the spread of, of mass and cheap media, thanks to cheap paper and thanks to cheap methods of printing, made it possible for people to read every morning in their daily newspapers about what was going on. And these newspapers had huge circulations, between a million and three million daily for, 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 a, for a single newspaper in a single city. And so what the people who met in Paris were having to deal with was the public opinion that could be expressed through letters to editors, letters to MPs, but crucially could be expressed in the next election. And so Lloyd George, who had run as head of a coalition in Britain in the late, just after the war ended, in the late autumn of 1918, had been elected on a platform of being tough with Germany. He headed what was mainly a conservative coalition, although he was a liberal. And that bound him in a sense. And like any politician, he was thinking ahead to the next election. I mean, it's very rare for a politician to say, I don't care about the next election. I will do what is right. Woodrow Wilson. They do sometimes. Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson had made, I think unwisely, the election of November 1918 a vote about the peace and for the Democrats. And in just so doing, he had alienated many of the Republicans who would have supported him. And Clemenceau, 
was supported by a highly nationalistic coalition, high, highly nationalistic party. And so they had this pressure of public opinion. And public opinion, as I think we all know, is not always coherent in what it wants. Public opinion can be confused, can want incompatible aims. And what public seemed to have wanted in no particular order in 1918 was peace and a better world. And there was a lot of enthusiasm for the sorts of ideas that Woodrow Wilson was, was expressing. They also wanted retribution. They wanted someone to be punished for what had happened. The French, who had seen their northern departments devastated, and these were the departments where most of their industry was, their heavy industry was, where their coal mines were, huge communications network, wanted someone to pay. As a French newspaper said, we didn't start the war, why should we pay for it? The Germans had declared war on France and had invaded France. And so French public opinion, yes, wanted a League of Nations, yes, wanted a better world, but also wanted Germany to pay up and Germany to be punished. And British public opinion was very much the same. Woodrow Wilson was quite clear that he didn't want anything for the United States out of the peace settlements, but that is not how the American public felt. The American public at this stage, although it later changed, was very hostile to Germany, or to what it called Prussianism. Prussia usually got the blame for anything that people disliked in Germany. And Wilson, in fact, was worried that the longer they delayed making the peace, the more American public opinion would push him into making a harsh peace. And so they were dealing with this knowledge that there was this thing called public opinion. What they were also dealing with was what was actually happening on the ground. And I've mentioned that the fear of revolution, and they, what they feared in 1918, sorry, 1919 was that the revolutionary tide was rising, not going down. What really made it different in 1814, 1815 was the revolutionary fires set off by the French Revolution had burned themselves out. They were gone. People wanted stability. They wanted peace. And if they didn't want it, they, they, they didn't dare say so. I mean, this was a time, this was a conservative reaction. But the mood in 1814, 1815 is we've had enough of this. We have had war ever since the beginning of the 1790s. We don't want any more excitement. This was not the feeling in large parts of the world, and not just in Europe, but in further afield in 1919. And of course, the other force that was still rising along sometimes mixed up with revolution, but not always, was ethnic nationalism. Because what the disappearance of the empires did was open the doors to emotions and forces that in many cases were already there. And the 19th century was an age of ethnic nationalism based on usually a, a bad history. I, I think as historians, we. We, we share a lot of the blame for this. Historians in the 19th century had been busy creating fake national histories. You know, his histories that our people were always superior, or our, peop or our people were always done down, or our people deserve now to triumph. And these were pernicious and often very dangerous stories. And they often said that you know, our people is different from that people. And so you got, here in Paris, you've got very learned professors saying, you know, you can never trust the Germans because they come in the north, particularly the Prussians again, they come from a very flat landscape and so they have no sense of up or down or good or evil. Um, <laughs> and you got German learned professors in Berlin saying the same thing. I mean, the, one of my classics was, was a German professor who said the French are deeply immoral, frivolous and idle. And he said to his readers, if you want to see examples of their immoral immorality and frivol frivolity, I can show you exactly where to go in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> but these were dangerous because they created a sense that we're all together and they are something different. And these nationalisms, which had been bubbling away, in some cases had been frustrated. German and Italian nationalism had created the modern Germany, the model, modern Italy, but within Austria-Hungary, within the Ottoman Empire, within Russia, throughout Europe, within the British Empire, within the United Kingdom, in Ireland, um, that you had these nationalisms which had, until the war broke out, been frustrated because the powers were too strong, could contain them. But what the war did with the disappearance of the big empires and the weakening of countries such as, as Britain was open those doors and open the possibility that they could finally get what they wanted, they could get their own countries. Poland, which was an old country which hadn't existed since the end of the, of the, of the 18th century, saw its opportunities because both, all three of its enemies were defeated. Russia was defeated, Austria was defeated, Germany was defeated, this was Poland's chance. The Czechs saw an opportunity to have a Czechoslovakia. The Yugoslavs 
or the Serbs saw an opportunity to have a Yugoslavia dominated by Serbia. And so ethnic nationalism, which is in its own way as powerful an emotion and a force as revolutionary, uh, revolutionary ideals, this was something people were prepared to fight and die for. And this was what they were having to deal with in Paris in 1919. And of course, their power, as others have noticed, was shrinking. They could not keep those, as soon as the war ended, those massive armies which they had kept in being, huge armies, had to be demobilized. The men themselves wanted to go home, their families wanted them to go home, and governments which were pushed very, very hard to find the money to continue the war effort couldn't keep on paying for them. And if they were slow in demobilizing, they saw the consequences. There were a number of mutinies throughout Europe as soldiers mutinied, sailors mutinied, wanting to get home, saying they saw no reason to go on fighting. And so, again, this is not to excuse what was done in Paris, but to understand it. They were facing often intractable problems. They were trying to deal with a series of crises which kept on coming in on them, and their power to deal with it was not as great as you would imagine. Having said that, I think they tried, and the peace settlements are not ideal, but I think they probably did, and this is not a ringing endorsement, they probably did the best of a bad job. They did manage to put together a new world organization. The first thing they negotiated, and Woodrow Wilson insisted on this, was the covenant of the League of Nations, and it incorporated his vision of a liberal world order with free trade. He believed it very important that unless you got rid of economic misery, economic um, grievances, that people would continue to be unhappy and you would have political instability, that you needed to wed political institutions to economic improvements. And he believed that the League of Nations would make this possible. He did not prescribe very, very rigorous rules for the League of Nations because he felt that it would develop its own rules as it went along. He was a great admirer of British parliamentary democracy and he felt that the British constitution by not being written down and by growing more or less organically was in fact a very good thing and a very good way of managing. And so the League of Nations Covenant was written. The German treaty was drawn up. It was not easy and two or three countries either walked out or threatened to walk out. Italy walked out. China threatened to walk out and in the end didn't sign it and Japan threatened to walk out but in the end stayed, which is one of the reasons why they simply gave it to the Germans and said we can't have negotiations. They were afraid of what would happen. Well, what did happen was a treaty which, of course, the Germans resented tremendously, and a set of other agreements, a collective peace, which left a lot of resentment among the losers. Hungary was stripped of Transylvania, which it never forgot. It hasn't forgotten to this day. If you go to Hungary, um, how many of you have heard of the Treaty of Trianon? Yeah, okay, you must be Hungarian, because <laughs> almost Every school child in, in Hungary knows about the Treaty of Trianon, but most people outside Hungary don't know. Um, Austria was left small and weak, um, a lot of resentment that it wasn't allowed to join with Germany. Bulgaria didn't get what it wanted. The Ottoman Empire, in fact, in the end refused to sign its treaty, but a lot of the victors were equally unhappy. Italy called the peace. It didn't get the territory, all of it, that it wanted. It called it the mutilated peace, and that resentment helped to put Mussolini into power. The French were left with fears of a resurgent Germany. They knew that the German population was bigger and the German birth rate was higher. And so there were more German soldiers coming down the pipeline. The, the real crunch time was going to come in the middle of the 1930s when there were going to be far fewer French young men of French military age in comparison to Germany. Japan, another of the victors, didn't feel that it had been properly treated for various reasons, didn't feel it had been treated as an equal, and China, of course, deeply, as we've heard, deeply resented what had happened. The most important, I think, and, and all of these had importance regionally, but I think perhaps the most important was the German resentment of the treaty. I don't think, myself, that the German public would have liked any treaty that it had to sign at the end of the First World War. Usually you don't like the treaty you sign when you lose a war. And if you go to court in a civil suit and you lose, you usually don't say, the judge was absolutely fair, I should have lost. <laughs> but it was more complicated than that. Germany did not think it had been defeated. And if you don't think you've been defeated, you don't think any set of peace terms are fair. The Germans had been defeated. They were defeated in the summer of 1918. The German lines broke on the 8th of August, the Black Day, as Ludendorff called it, of the German army. And if you look at the map, the Germans are going back steadily 
towards their own borders, lines that had barely budged for four years and now moving very, very rapidly indeed. The German commanders in the field are sending desperate things back to Berlin saying, we can't fight on, we don't have the manpower, you're sending us 15-year-old boys or 46-year-old men. We don't have fuel, we don't have ammunition, we don't have food. We, you have got to get an armistice. And the high command, Ludendorff dominating it, panicked and said to the civilian government, which it, kept, it had kept in the dark up to this point, get an armistice immediately, which is why the German government appealed to Woodrow Wilson to broker an armistice. But the high command managed to dodge responsibility for this. Ludendorff himself went off to Sweden, disguised in false whiskers and dark glasses, um, but came back to Germany eventually and went round saying, you know, we could have fought on. Actually, he, he denied all responsibility for the loss, which is not at all the case. And he went around saying we could have fought on. It was those at home who broke, who wouldn't fight on, who stabbed us in the back. And so this pernicious and very powerful myth grew up in Germany that Germany had been stabbed in the back. And you can work out who the suspects would have been. The liberals, the socialists, the communists, and the Jews had stabbed Germany in the back. So the treaty was illegitimate in German eyes right from the beginning. And then in the, what you got in the 1920s was a revision of the origins of the war. The Allies had been perfectly clear that Germany had started the war and its allies had started the war. But gradually in the 1920s, as the German foreign office, a special office in the German foreign office, selectively re released documents, called in special favored historians, including a, a famous American called Harry Elmer Barnes, and showed them these documents, and historians love new documents, and so they read them, and it seemed to show that no one had started the First World War. It had simply happened. It was one of those things. And this is when we get the myth that Europe had sleptwalked over the edge into war, that Germany bore no responsibility, or Austria-Hungary bore no responsibility. So if Germany hadn't lost the war, if it hadn't started the war, then the treaty was doubly illegitimate. And so right across the political spectrum in Germany, you got a sense that the treaty was wrong, was unfair, and that Germany was entitled, and it was perfectly legitimate for Germany to try and avoid its conditions. And so the Germans did their best to avoid paying reparations in the end, never paid that much, but the feeling in Germany was they had paid too much. And that, again, it was, is, is very important, what people feel. Germany was not meant to have a weapons industry, not meant to produce certain kinds of weapons, not meant to have tanks, but they built them and, and tested them in, in, in Russia. There was a joke which was told openly in the cabarets in Weimar by the end of the 1920s about the man whose brother-in-law was having a baby and wife was having a baby and, and the man said, well, I work in a factory that makes prams. I'm on the assembly line so I can steal you a bit. I'll steal the bit that comes by me and I'll get my friends to steal the other bits and I'll smuggle them out. And he said to his brother-in-law, you put them together and you'll have a pram for the new child. And so he smuggled all the bits out, you know, not knowing what they were all for, but smuggled them out and then said to his brother-in-law, so how's the baby carriage? How's the pram? And the brother said, I don't know. He said, I'm doing something wrong. Every time I put it together, I get a machine gun. <laughs> and this was, you know, but this was being told openly. I mean, everybody knew that Germany was not obeying the disarmament clauses of the treaty. And so when you have a, a peace agreement that leaves too many loose ends, which doesn't deal with the defeated power in a way that either brings it back into the international system or keeps it under control, then you do have the problem that was going to arise in the 1930s. I still think that war could have been avoided if it had not been for the Great Depression. If you look at what was happening in the 1920s, Europe was getting back onto a more normal footing, and so was the world. European production had reached pre-war levels by 1925. It wasn't a happy continent, but it was getting less unhappy. And Germany itself, under, I think, the enlightened leadership of Gustav Stresemann, was adopting a policy of fulfilling the treaty and trying to modify it as it could. Germany joined the League of Nations. And the League itself, which is now seen, I think, unfairly as something that was a total failure, was actually enjoying some successes. It had managed to diffuse a number of really difficult conflicts, for, for example, between Corfu and, and Italy, over, between Greece and Italy over Corfu. But it was also building institutions such as the International Labour Organization. It was building organizations and, and developing expertise in dealing with things like trade, poverty, 
late, slavery. I mean, many of the institutions and peoples who went into the United Nations came from the League of Nations. The United States, although it had turned away a bit from Europe, was still involved. It was still involved in Europe. It helped to broker agreements on reparations, getting the bill lowered. It supported the League of Nations. Americans were at the League as observers. It supported the various disarmament attempts that were made in the 1920s, including spectacularly, of course, the Washington Naval Conference. And so I think if you had looked at Europe by the end of the 1920s and the world, you would have said it's not bad, it's not great, but things seem to be moving on an even keel. There seems to be an international order. And I think the thing that really pushed the world down those, that path to the Second World War was the Great Depression. I think it drove countries into trying to set up autarkies, trying to set up systems in which they could um, produce and, and, and consume all they needed where they didn't need things from abroad. In the case of Japanese, it, Japan, it pushed them into a more militaristic direction and, and encouraged the Jap Japanese to try and build an empire. And of course, in the case of Germany, it pushed people into the radical extremes of either communism or Nazism, and I think opened the door wide open for the Nazis, who did not still, I think, have to get in, except for the folly of various people in the conservative circles in Germany who thought they could use them, who thought that they could put Hitler into power as chancellor, use his popular support, and get rid of him when they wanted. And of course, he did exactly the opposite to them. And so we got a Second World War. I think the First World War certainly helped to create the resentments and the issues and some of the instabilities that were going to be exploited. But I think without decisions made towards the end of the 1930s and without the impact of the Great Depression, I think it might well not have happened. Well, we had a Second World War even more dreadful than the first. And in 1945, when peace came to be made, there was no comprehensive peace conference. And that was partly because the Allies fell out very quickly at the end of the war. But there was also no question this time of how the defeated would be treated. The Allies adopted a policy of unconditional surrender for Germany and Japan, and this was because of what they concluded had gone wrong at the end of the First World War. Germany and Japan were both occupied. Um, reparations were extracted when they could be, although most, I think, realized that it wasn't much point in doing it. What I think made a difference at the end of, of the Second World War, however, was that the United States decided this time to stay in Europe. And it did not decide it immediately. It decided it partly because the Soviets were busy building an empire in the center of Europe, which alarmed and concerned American policymakers and, and American public opinion, and partly because they recognized that if they didn't get involved, the Europe which they had spent a lot of American lives and a lot of American resources to save from one dictator was going to fall under another. And so I think also the third factor is that you had a political leader who, unlike Woodrow Wilson, was able to make it bipartisan. Roosevelt made joining the United Nations and supporting an international order something that was bipartisan, and he managed to get approval through Congress. But it took also, I think, Soviet actions to persuade the United States that they needed to join NATO and that they needed to do the Marshall Plan. And so what we got was a different sort of settlement, no comprehensive settlement, but we still have some of the problems that were there in 1914, 1918, 1919, and 1945. We have had a period, those of us who live in, in the fortunate parts of the world, of being free from conflict, but many parts of the world have not been so fortunate. We still have some of the problems that they used to have. We still have ethnic nationalism. We still have the instability caused by growing inequality. And I think, worryingly, we have a loss of faith in democracy and elites and the rise of anti-democratic forces, which can remind us, I think, sometimes of what was happening in the 1930s. But I think all I can say is we look back at what happened in 1919. It's 100 years now. We should have some humility. And we should ask ourselves not just what would, what would we have done then, but are we any, any better at making peace today? I'm not sure what the answer is. Thank you. seven or eight minutes. Why don't uh, we take a few questions at a time and then we can give Ms. McMillan a chance to 
perhaps I've answered all your questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. A lot of the focus here has been on making peace. Yeah. It's led me to, to think about making war. Uh, we had a little chat earlier. Yeah. I'm wondering if by studying the foundations for war and the consequences, we might be able to avert it better than peace processes. Well, it's a very good question. Should we, should we do more to understand the causes of wars and the consequences? The causes of war are so difficult. I mean, we can see the longer term causes, but I think we can never predict the role of accident in starting a war. You know, the assassination of the, the Archduke's car taking the wrong turning in Sarajevo. You know, who knows? If he hadn't been assassinated, would there have been a war in 1914? Um, I do think it's important for us to understand what war can mean and, and what the impact can be on society. You know, we tend, I think, if we live in peaceful societies, to have a rather glamorized view of war. It's something we see in Hollywood movies, which, with some notable exceptions, tend to give a rather um, glamorous view of war, where people don't really get hurt, or if they do, they're bandaged up and removed from the scene. It's, you know, there are some very realistic movies on war. But I think what happens, and I don't know how we overcome this, is as time goes by, we forget. You know, the, the, and we forget because the people who experience war firsthand disappear from the scene. You know, until, I'm trying to think which American president it was. Was it President Bush Sr.? Until then, almost every president had been in the military and had experienced war. Clinton was the exception, I think. But we now have people in office who've never experienced war directly. And we ourselves, collectively as a society, don't remember it all that vividly. The people who could have told us about it are now disappearing from the scene. And I think that's dangerous because we can see war as something that's easy, cheap. You know, whenever people say you can fight an easy war, you know, they're wrong. Um, Clausewitz was absolutely right. War is unpredictable. Once you get in, you don't know where it's going. You don't know how you're going to get out. And you have to remember that. And I think. That collective memory is something, I don't know how we encourage it and how we remind people that war is very dangerous. And it's, it's one of those things you don't want to start um, unless you have some way of stopping it. And even then, you may not be able to stop it. So, yeah. Yes, we had a question to Steve. <laughs> Hi, Margaret. Thank you very, very much for that. I was curious, you, you made some fairly gentle references um, to current situations and parallels in terms of anxiety and globalization. There's a kind of modish theory now that, oh, it's like fascism. Fascism's on the rise. Secretary of State, former Secretary of Madeleine Albright has written a little book about it. Do you think all this is overdone? I mean, how do you feel about, I mean, what, what are the real analogies to today that make the most sense to you? I, I, I mean, I think we, we can overdo it. I mean, we're not in the 1930s. I think we did learn something from the 1930s. We have, although they're now under challenge, but we do have, inter we have an international economic order. Uh, we learned from the 1930s, and I think it's, it's very um, instructive that a number of those who were involved in dealing with the crisis of 2008 had actually studied the Great Depression and understood that the, you know, the, and we, I think Keynesian economics, which is currently unfashionable, but I think we do realize that when you suffer a real depression, what you don't want to do is put up tariff walls, tariff barriers so that trade falls off, and you don't want to try and, and cut, because what you really need to do at that point is, is stimulate the economy. I think we're more sophisticated in understanding of, of what can be done and what needs to be done, and we also have economic institutions which are criticized, but they're still with us. Um, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, which helped to bring nations together. And so I think to say this is like the 1930s, I think is, is to exaggerate and, and fear-mongering. That doesn't mean that there aren't certain things. Uh, the rise of populism, and I, I define populism not as popular protest. I think there are lots of things we may want to protest about, and, and you get protest parties like the Greens, but they will work within the system. The sorts of populists I really worry about are the ones who only want to get into power using democratic means so they can trash the system. You know, and it's when they use the language, which is deeply divisive, when they say, you know, like Marine Le Pen does or Nigel Farage does in England, I speak for the ordinary person, I speak for the little person, I speak, you know, they don't. Who elected them? You know, and they claim to speak with this authoritative voice. And of course, anyone who disagrees with them is by definition not part of the people. And they play on divisions in society. And that's where I find them very destructive. So I think we saw that before the First World War. We saw it in the 1930s. 
I do think and I hope that in certainly in a lot of countries, democratic and, and, and legal institutions are more deeply rooted than they were. I mean, Germany, the Weimar Republic was shaky from the start, and Germany was a very new country, which, you know, it's, it's, it's younger than Canada um, as a country, and it has been through a lot more difficult times than Canada certainly has been, but it took us a long time to develop our institutions. It took, you know, we look at British parliamentary democracy, it took them 600 years and they're still working on it at the moment. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think we, we, we need to recognize that, you know, the representative government, republics, democracies, constitutional monarchies, whatever, depends on values, it depends on understandings, it depends on an agreement, a sort of shared set of the rules. And I think that is more deeply rooted now in many, well, it certainly is in Germany. You know, Germany is now, in many ways, the sort of model of what a democracy should be. So I'm not as worried. I mean, I think Italian democracy was very imperfect in the 19 period right after the First World War. It was deeply, a deeply divided country. In Germany, you had huge sections of the population in the middle class and the elites who simply didn't accept any form of representative government who, who had nostalgia for the old days. So I think we're, we're living in a different world, but that doesn't mean we should be complacent. You know, what worries me is we, we fail to understand that you have to keep working at these things. You know, you can't just take them for granted. You have to, you know, we all have to be involved. Perhaps, you know, I'm sure you are all involved, but it means we can't just sit back. And I find there's a sort of dangerous, and, and you got it in Weimar Germany, but oh, well, they're all corrupt. And so I'm going to keep my hands clean and not vote. And that's very dangerous. You know, you're not actually keeping your hands clean. You're, you're simply refusing to take responsibility. But I think we can overdo saying this is just like the 1930s. And I think the word fascist is thrown around much too loosely. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for one last question. Yes. I'm wondering, um, do you have a way of approaching historical sources or do you have a method of reading history that keeps you from falling into the hindsight trap and all the other cognitive biases yeah. that resulted yeah. in the seemingly not very fair interpretations of yeah. this treaty up until now? It's very, very hard. And I think, you know, look, we're all products of our own societies. And so I read history as a Canadian woman you know, from, you know, so I'm bound to bring that with me. But I think we all try very hard to understand the past in its own terms. You know, to understand and to understand the language they're using. And, and the way I do it is I just read as much as I possibly can. And I read primary sources, I read diaries, but I also read the fiction from the time. Because you get a sense of what people are thinking about and what they're feeling. And that's the best you can do. And I think you have to keep telling yourself, they didn't know how the story was going to end. You know, so when people made decisions, you can't, you know, in Paris, they didn't know that there was a, you know, miserable corporal called Adolf Hitler lying in a hospital bed who was miser miserable because Germany had been defeated. They didn't know that. They didn't know he was going to become powerful. They, they couldn't have taken steps to prevent it. So I think, you know, that's, that's too obvious an example. But I think we have to try. We have to always struggle against bringing our present preoccupations in. But we'll never, you know, that's why history keeps changing. You know, but we keep on doing our best. And we keep on trying, I think, to respect the evidence. And so, you know, looking at what people said and did at the time, you have to try, and you have to understand them as people. You have to understand their class background, their social backgrounds, their, you know, where do they come from? And what made Clemenceau, what made Lloyd George? They bring their own preoccupations to the table. And Woodrow Wilson, you know, you need to know that, I, you have to know he's a southerner to understand him, partly, I think. And you have to know that his father was a Presbyterian minister. You know, the language that Woodrow Wilson uses is very much that of a Presbyterian. And so without knowing that, you, you miss a dimension of these people. But no, we never get it right. Um, sometimes, you know, we envy people who write historical fiction. They have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>